Representative Bridges. Here. Representative Frazier Gordon. Here. Representative Mary Lou Marzian. Uh, Co-Chair West. Here. And Co-Chair Hale. Here. We have a quorum. With the quorum being present, the subcommittee is uh, duly constituted today to do business. The first matter of business on our agenda today is approval of the minutes of the last meeting. Are there any additions or corrections to the minutes of the last meeting? If not, is there a motion for approval? Is there a second? There is a motion and a second without objection. It is so ordered. Uh, we will move right into the meeting. So please call the first regulation. Finance and Administration Cabinet Executive Branch Ethics Commission. 9 KAR 1070 with a staff suggested amendment. 91070 establishes ethical conduct standards for transition teams. The staff suggested amendment amends various sections to comply with KRS Chapter 13A, including to delete an incorporated form. Do we have anyone here with the that's going to present? Please come forward. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome today. Would you please identify yourself today for the record? Yes, my name is Stephen Pulliam. Uh, sir, please push your mic until the little red, green light comes on. All right. Now go right ahead, sir. I'm Stephen Pulliam. I'm general counsel for the Executive Branch Ethics Commission. Thank you, sir. There is a staff amendment. Uh, is there a motion for approval of the staff amendment at this time? There is a motion. Is there a and there is a second. Without objection, it is so ordered. Are there any questions from any members of the subcommittee? Uh, for the gentleman before us today. Anything, sir, you'd like to add? No, I just appreciate the work of the LRC staff to help us get this reg moving. Looks great. Thank you, sir. We appreciate your time. Uh, there being no questions, please call the next regulation. Board of Pharmacy 201 KAR 2440 with staff suggested. This administrative regulation establishes a legend drug repository program as required by statute, establishes definitions and requirements relating to participation in the program, acceptance, inspection, and storage of drugs, distribution and dispensing of drugs, and forms and record keeping for the program. The staff suggested amendment amends various sections to comply with the drafting and formatting requirements of KRS Chapter 13A, and also amends Section 7 to add a URL for material incorporated by reference. Would you please identify yourself today for the record, sir? Yes, good afternoon. Chris Harlow, Executive Director, Kentucky Board of Pharmacy. Thank you, Mr. Harlow, uh, for being with us today. There is a staff amendment. Is there a motion for approval? There is a motion and there is a second. Without objection, it is so ordered. Are there any members that has a question for Mr. Harlow? Uh, Representative Marcy. Of course I do. <laughs> Welcome, Chris. <laughs> so you. good to see Thank you again. Just tell me what a legend drug repository program is. Sure, this this was established. Um, the General Assembly passed um, passed a bill and it amended 315 to allow uh, the legend drug repository program, which is basically a donation program. So for That's individuals right. that have high cost medications, they want to donate back. As long as they meet the certain standards, then a pharmacy may participate in um, in the program. For and this is for low cost um, um, or for indigent populations or, or individuals that can't afford so high, high cost medications. One more question. Yes, so please. you can donate them back to the pharmacy or could you give them to a provider's office perhaps? Or? They have to be, there's there's definitions of donors and recipients built into mm -hmm. the regulation and a, and a pharmacy is is um, um, is the recipient and um, and then we have the, the donors that can be the, the patients or providers. Okay, great, mm -hmm. thanks. Senator Yates, go ahead, sir. Thank you. And I'm showing my ignorance a little bit with this, but just to follow up, sure. um, are there certain parameters in which that only certain drugs can be donated because of necessity? Uh, for instance, um, fertility clinics wind up being very, very expensive. The drugs they take, sometimes people will pay nine, ten, eleven thousand dollars to get right. up to it. In the event that doesn't work out, there's a lot of times a stockpile of that. Um, my understanding was that they could not be donated back. Is that, is that part of the program? Yeah, so there there are um, parameters in which drugs cannot be donated back. They have to be in the original package. Um, they can't be expired, so we want to make sure they're not expired. Um, so they have to be essentially reusable. Okay, but but it's not it's not specific to their necessity or anything. Even even things. Correct. Like, okay. Correct. Thank you. Are there any other questions? 
Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. For your being with us and your explanation. Being no further questions, at this time, please call the next regulation. Board of Speech, Language, Pathology, and Audiology, 201 KAR 17110 with staff suggested amendment. This regulation is being amended to allow the initial meeting regarding telehealth to take place via telehealth, clarify the requirements for informed consent and secure communication, and allow for the participation of a person licensed by a compact state. The staff suggested amendment amends various sections to correct statutory citations and make technical changes. Good afternoon. Please identify yourself for the record, please. Yes, sir. Kevin Winstead, Commissioner of the Department of Professional. I Health. think you need to turn your mic on, sir. Sorry, I thought the green light was on. Thank you. Now go ahead and proceed again. Thank please. you. Kevin Winstead, Commissioner of the Department of Professional Licensing and the contact person for this regulation. Thank you, Mr. Winstead. Uh, there is a staff amendment to this regulation. Is there a motion for approval? There is, and there is a motion. There has been a motion, and there has been a second without objection. It is so ordered. Are there any questions from any of the members of the subcommittee at this time? There are appearing to be no questions. Thank you, sir, for your time today. Please call the next regulation. Board of Nursing, 201 KAR 2260 Emergency with an Agency Amendment, 201 KAR 2480 uh, Emergency in Ordinary. 201 KR 2260E amends to make changes pursuant to executive order, statute, and Senate Bill 150 from the 2020 regular session, including to delete the requirement for a request for an increase in student enrollment to be submitted two months prior to the increase, add simulation resources to substitute clinical site resources, require board approval within 30 days of a completed request for an increase in enrollment if the program of nursing has demonstrated sufficient resources to support the increase and require new campuses to be considered as enrollment increases and not separate programs of nursing. The agency amendment amends the statutory authority and necessity function and conformity paragraphs to add citations to a statute added by Senate Bill 10 from the 22 uh, regular session, amend section 2 and 3 for consistency with changes made in Senate Bill 10, and amend section three to correct cross references to cite more specifically to a subsection for consistency with an executive order. 201 KR 2480E and O, both amend to make changes pursuant to executive order statute and Senate Bill 150 from the 2020 regular session, including to require an applicant for licensure by endorsement who is a graduate of a foreign nursing school to submit a full education course by course report from the Commission on Graduates of Foreign Nursing Schools, uh, Credentials Evaluation Service rather than Visa Screen, add a requirement for English language proficiency examination, and set a required score previously covered by Visa Screen. The staff suggested amendments for both of these, the ENO, amend for compliance with Senate Bill 10 from the 2022 regular session, including to reference the submission of documentation requirements for applicants in the statutes added by Senate Bill 10. Um, amends the necessity function and conformity paragraph and sections one and two for clarity and to comply with CARES chapter 13A. Good afternoon. Uh, please identify yourself for the record. Yes. Time. Whoa. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good afternoon. Jeff Prather, General Counsel, Board of Nursing. Thank you, Mr. Prather, uh, for being with us today. There are staff amendments to these regulations. Is there a motion for approval, please? There is a motion and a, there is a second without objection. It is so ordered. There is also an agency amendment. Is there any discussion on the agency amendment? There appearing to be no discussion. Is there a motion for approval? There is a motion and a second without objection. It is so ordered. Are there any questions on this uh, specific regulation from any of the members today? Anything, sir, you'd like to add? Uh, no, thank you. All right, thank you, sir. No, There being no questions, so we thank you for your time today. Please call the next regulation. Board of Physical Therapy, 201 KAR 22020, 070, and 170. 020 and 170 have staff suggested amendments. 22020 updates the form used to request a testing accommodation for a disability. 22070 amends to require foreign educated applicants to meet spe specified individual and overall examination scores. 
22170 amends to update the compact commission rules and bylaws, including requiring self-reporting if participating in a confidential alternative program and establishing a new standing compliance committee. The staff amendments for 22020 and 22070 amend various sections to comply with 13A drafting and formatting requirements. Would you please identify yourself today for the record? Yes, my name is Stephen Curley. I'm the Executive Director for the Kentucky Board of Physical Therapy. Thank you, Mr. Curley. We appreciate your time here today. Uh, there are staff amendments on these regulations. Is there a motion for approval of the staff amendments? There has been a motion and a second without objection. It is so ordered. Do we have any questions today for many of the members on the specific regs that were mentioned? There being no questions, thank you, sir, for your time today. Please call the next regulation. Thank you, guys. Board of Licensure and Certification for Dietitians and Nutritionists, 201KR330015 with staff suggested amendment. 201KR3315 amends to clarify requirements for individuals pursuing due licensure and replaces the application for licensure or certification and verification of licensure in other jurisdictions forms with a new application for licensure, certification, or dual licensure. The staff suggested amendment amends various sections to comply with CARES Chapter 13A. Good afternoon to both of you. Uh, would you please identify yourself, ma'am, for the record, and then we'll go over to the gentleman for the record, please. Yes, my name is Laura Parks, and I'm the board chair for Kentucky uh, Dietitians and Nutritionists. Hello, I'm August Posgay. I'm board counsel. Could you make sure your microphone is on, sir? Push the button until the green light comes on. Uh, yes, August Posgay. I'm board counsel. Thank you both today. Um, there is a staff amendment to this regulation. Is there a motion for approval? There is a motion and a second. Without objection, it is so ordered. Are there any questions today from anyone? We thank you for your time today. We are on a roll today so far. We're, we're moving right along. Please thank call you. the next regulation. Board of Alcohol and Drug Counselors, 201-KER-35070 with staff suggested amendment. This regulation is being amended to clarify that observation rather than teleconferencing is a method of clinical supervision and change KBADC Form 13 to reflect that clarification, provide that a person approved on or after March 24, 2021 to provide supervision will have a maximum of five consecutive years from the date of the approval to meet the requirements of KRS 309-0834 to become a certified clinical supervisor and can continue to provide supervision until the earlier of the expiration of the five-year period or the date they become a certified clinical supervisor and that approval as a supervisor shall be limited to five years the approval cannot be extended beyond the five-year limit and the approval is available only once in the person's lifetime Allow the board to extend certification as a certified clinical supervisor to a person who is approved to provide clinical supervision but does not meet all the provisions of KRS 309-0834 if the person submits the form created by the amendment to this regulation and meets certain criteria and require a person approved before March 24, 2021 to provide clinical supervision to apply for grandparenting as a certified clinical supervisor within 12 months of the effective date of this amendment. The staff suggested amendment amends various sections and the material incorporated by reference to comply with the drafting and formatting requirements of KRS Chapter 13A and make technical changes. Gentlemen, would you please at this time again both introduce yourself for the record today, please? Yes, sir. Kevin Winstead, Commissioner of the Department of Professional Licensing. I'm the contact person for this regulation. With me today is Tim Cesario, who's the chair of the Board of Alcohol and Drug Counselors and a licensed clinical alcohol and drug counselor. All right, thank you both. There is a staff amendment to the regulation. Is there a motion for approval? There is a, has been a motion in a second without objection, it is so ordered. Do we have any questions? Uh, yes, sir, Senator Yates, go right ahead, sir. First of all, thank you both for being here. I was going through reading uh, just some of the amendments, a lot of technical things got in here. Uh, but because this is such an important um, part of legislation we just addressed this past session as far as funding as well, uh, can you just explain what's required by these supervisors on here? Um, obviously, we have the board and alcohol. Um, you have different people who are, who are counselors. Uh, we know that sometimes that we put people into roles where they're directly overseeing people um, before they've actually achieved their credentials. 
um, but that's only if they're, I guess, temporary um, counselors, or can you explain the process? Uh, since we put about $100 million into it, just kind of let us know how that's being done. Yes, sir, and I believe Mr. Uh, Chairman Cesario may have the best information okay. for you. Okay, so you're correct. It would be for entry-level uh, counselors that would be providing oversight for them. Uh, so in order to become a, a certified or a approved clinical supervisor, it, a CADC or an LADC would have to have two years post-certification or licensure experience and be in good standing with the board and be trained by the board um, in the uh, supervision uh, requirements. For a licensed clinical alcohol and drug counselor or LA, LCADC, uh, that person would have to be a year post licensure or uh, trained by the board in, in the uh, supervision practices. When someone's pursuing a uh, CADC, for example, uh, the base requirement for them is 300 hours of supervision, uh, which takes approximately six years to, to complete. Uh, the requirement uh, for supervision monthly is two hours twice a month, okay? So it takes about six years. That can be adjusted according to what type of degree they have. If it's a clinical degree, uh, bachelor's level, then it would be 200 hours of supervision. If it's master's level, it would be 100 hours of supervision. If, if I may, just a quick... Yes, and, and I Go ahead, sir. I appreciate you, the, the technical. I'm, I'm jotting down as fast as I can, but my real question is, so do we... Right now, um, we have a lot of people suffering from addiction issues. Mm -hmm. um, we have mandatory treatment, and then the, those that have been paid for. Um, we have super. We have people who are counselors who are meeting with them, who actually aren't certified yet, but they're under the direction of someone who is certified. That's correct. Um, and did you just tell me that that the requirement of this right now is that they only ha have two hours, two times a month of that supervision? That's the minimum requirement. Okay. And so if you get into uh, non-degreed uh, people such as uh, peer support specialists even after they get full registration they have to continue in clinical supervision uh, for the time that they're serving in that capacity under that credential so the individuals that, that we have into drug treatment who have the peer support temporary counselors in there um, is there a requirement that their supervisors going through and checking on how they're treating each and every client absolutely there's a requirement for direct supervision uh, every six months i believe so twice a year um, the meetings, uh, the two hours twice a month uh, of meetings is to review cases and, and documentation and that sort of thing. And in the event that they fail to do that and they sign off on someone, what is the consequence? Well, the, the clinical supervisor takes responsibility for the supervisee's practice. Even, even if they've met with them twice a month? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Senator West, go ahead, sir. Got similar questions to Senator Yates, uh, just a little bit different tract. Um, so, prior to this requirement, uh, the supervision requirement, uh, what is the educational requirement to get to that? Is there to that point to become a supervisor? No, to no to be um, to be supervised, <laughs> to be the person. Um, Okay, to, to doing, the, doing the consulting and the... To become an entry-level yes. clinician? Yeah, that's, okay. so yes. So up until two years ago, the requirement was a bachelor's degree. It didn't matter what the domain was in. Uh, you could become a CADC with, with a bachelor's degree. And I believe it was 2020, um, was it Senate Bill 191, uh, that created two credentials called a Certified Alcohol and Drug Counselor Associate 1 and 2. Uh, a person can become a, an Associate 1 or 2 uh, without a degree. They would have to have a high school diploma, I believe, to, to be able to apply for that. And they would have to be under supervision of either a licensed clinical alcohol and drug counselor, a licensed alcohol and drug counselor, or a certified alcohol and drug counselor. So I, I may have misheard you right there. Did you say they have to have a bachelor's degree for the entry level? We did that when we passed the law or not? It, when the law was passed, it reduced the requirement. Sir, before you answer, could you just pull your mic a little bit? I think we're having a little trouble picking you up there. Yeah, you I'm just sorry, I missed little... the middle part there. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. You're fine. Uh, when Senate Bill 191 was passed, that re that removed the requirement of a bachelor's degree, and okay. it allowed people without a bachelor's degree to, to 
enter as a CADC associate one and begin getting the education and supervision requirements required. And so therefore, that's why the supervision is so important. Yes. Gotcha. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Thank you both today. We appreciate your uh, your time and your, your answers to our questions. Uh, very much, very, uh, uh, very important issue, and we, we very much appreciate you taking the time today to answer that. Please, uh, at this Thank time, you. call the next regulation. Thank you, gentlemen. Board of Medical Imaging and Radiation Therapy, 201 KAR 46060 with staff suggested amendment. 201 KAR 46060 amends to provide clarity on updated methods of obtaining continuing education credits and removes one of the me methods for obtaining continuing education courses. The staff suggested amendment amends various sections to comply with KRS Chapter 13A. Good afternoon. Would you please identify yourself today? Yes. Elizabeth Morgan, Executive Director, Board of Medical Imaging and Radiation Therapy. Thank you, Ms. Morgan. We appreciate you being with us today. Uh, there is a staff amendment to this regulation. Is there a proof or a motion? There is a motion and a second without objection. It is so ordered. Are there any questions? Senator West uh, has a question. Go ahead, sir. What, what method are we removing from? Um, the ability to obtain continuing education for the preparation of a continuing education program. Gotcha, gotcha. So you can no longer get continuing education credit for, for putting together the continuing education. Correct. Got it. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? There being no further questions, uh, thank you very much today. Please call the next thank regulation. You. Tourism, Arts, and Heritage Cabinet, Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources, 301 KAR 4010 20 100 and 110, all with staff suggested amendments. 301-4010 through 4110, update wildlife regulations, including the designation of counties for districts, the administration of drugs to wildlife, and provisions for Ballard and Peabody wildlife management areas. The staff suggested amendments amend various sections to comply with CARES Chapter 13A. Additionally, 301-4020 deletes restrictions on firearms and dogs. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome today. Would uh, each one of you, starting with the lady, please introduce yourself and go across the table there for the record today. Jenny Gilbert, the Office of the Commissioner. Rich Storm, Commissioner. Steve Field, Staff Attorney. Again, thank you all today for being with us uh, at our meeting today. Uh, there is a, or there are staff amendments to these regulations, or, or is there a motion for approval of the staff amendments? There is a motion and a second. Without objection, it is so ordered. Do we have any questions from any of the members today for any of our guests from Fish and Wildlife? Are we sure we have no questions for our guests from Fish and Wildlife today? It appears there are no questions, so uh, y'all must have done good this time. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all very much. Uh, please call the next regulation. It's time. Board of Education, 702-KAR-3090, 704-KAR-7170, 704-KAR-19002, all of those with staff suggested amendments, and 780-KAR-3020. 702-3090 is being amended to conform to collateral requirements of KRS 41240 as required by KRS 16570 and provide additional types of collateral for school district deposits. The staff suggested amendment amends various sections to comply with the drafting requirements of KRS Chapter 13A. 704-7170 establishes the minimum requirements for the use of corporal punishment including a requirement to attain parental consent prior to use, the requirements for the deployment of additional behavior management best practices and supports, and the requirements for documentation and reporting. 704-19002 is being amended to provide clarity and uniformity to alternative education programs, update definitions to clarify the distinction between an on-site versus off-site program, and create a uniform definition for a long-term <coughs> placement, create a new requirement for additional procedures within district-level policies that encourage greater monitoring and interaction between district-level staff and alternative education program staff, and clarify the expectation that districts ensure 
that partnering organizations are providing appropriate data for inclusion in the student information system. The staff suggested amendment to these two regulations amend section one to comply with the drafting requirements of KRS chapter 13A. 780-3020 is being amended to update terminology on organizational changes, remove requirements that no longer align to Kentucky Department of Education personnel policies, and remove the 2008 Kentucky Tech salary schedule incorporated by reference. Gentlemen, would you please identify yourself today for the record? Good afternoon, Todd Allen, General Counsel for the State Board of Education. Good afternoon, Matthew Courtney, Policy Advisor, Kentucky Department of Education. Again, we are we welcome you to our meeting this afternoon. There are staff amendments uh, to these regulations. Is there a motion for approval? There is a motion and there is a second. Without objection, it is so ordered. Are there any questions from the members of the subcommittee? Senator West has a question. Go ahead, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the presentation. Um, my questions pertain to corporal punishment. Um, what is the reason for these regulatory changes in this area? Thank you for that question. Um, this regulation is being brought in response to the Department of Education's implementation of the School Safety and Resiliency Act of 2019. Under that act, um, school districts are required to um, create local policies related to trauma-informed discipline. Corporal punishment is largely accepted by the field to not be a trauma-informed discipline practice however it is allowable in the statute and so we felt like this was an appropriate time to provide some safety and guardrails around corporal punishment um, and to provide some additional guidance to districts who choose to continue to use that statutorily um, allowed disciplinary resolution so if you could just go in briefly to we have some you know executive summaries here but Specifically, what does the new what did the new regs do? What's what are the guardrails that, that the sure. regs set up? Um, so let me just flip through here real quick. So um, one of the things that we've done is we've provided a standard definition for corporal punishment. So that's uh, the first time that that will show up in regulation for us. We have exempted um, a handful of students from experiencing corporal punishment at school. Those are students with individual education plans, um, IEPs, those are special education students, as well as students in foster care um, or homeless students. State regulation already prohibits um, foster care parents from using corporal punishment within the home, so we're just extending that protection to the school for that group of students. It also exempts um, uh, homeless homeless youth as well. This, these are populations of youth who experience high trauma already, and so we want to exempt them from potentially higher traumatic experiences at school. It includes parent notification and involvement requirements. So uh, within the first five days of enrollment, schools must receive um, written consent from parents to even consider corporal punishment for their students. And then before administering a corporal punishment on on the day of, they must receive verbal consent from the parent. We think that parental involvement is really important in corporal punishment because we know that corporal punishment at home is not a monolith and that parents may use corporal punishment in different ways under different circumstances. They should have the opportunity to weigh in on whether or not corporal punishment is appropriate for their child. Um, we have also included a requirement that um, a trauma-informed strategy is deployed first before a corporal punishment. This is a requirement that exists in other spaces that exists in the special education space and in other with spaces with students with disabilities and 504 plans, so we're just carrying that forward. Um, it restricts the corporal punishment to only be delivered by the principal or assistant principal, so the leader in that building has to make that decision. It also um, prohibits anyone from being required to administer or witness a corporal punishment, um, so that's protecting our staff from some vicarious trauma, which we know, especially after COVID-19, has been a problem in our schools. Um, and finally, um, it produces some um, data reporting requirements so that we can um, enforce the regulation. Uh, if I could continue. Mr. Yes, go right ahead, sir. So could you specifically show me in the Resiliency and Safety, School Safety and Resil Resiliency Act where we intended for that to cover corporal punishment? 
So the School Safety and Resiliency Act does not address corporal punishment directly. Um, it, what it addresses is the implementation of a trauma-informed disciplinary policy. Corporal punishment is not a trauma-informed disciplinary policy. And in, in crafting this regulation, we did review all of the research literature we could find. Over 200 studies related to corporal punishment at school unanimously find that corporal punishment is an ineffective long-term solution and does create trauma, um, creates difficulty building relationships in the schoolhouse. I know there was a bill this year in session that would have eliminated corporal punishment. Um, and it, I don't think it passed. <laughs> we cover a lot of bills. Sorry, I can't remember everything. But um, is this sort of an end around around that effort to do away with corporal punishment? So this really will um, increase parental involvement in the corporal punishment process. Districts are required under the regulation to create a corporal punishment policy that is transparent, that is adopted by that school board, so parents will have an opportunity to engage at that level um, about whether or not they want corporal punishment as an option in their district. Most states in Kentucky, or states in Kentucky, <laughs> districts in Kentucky already prohibit corporal punishment by policy. There's only about 15 who either allow it or are silent on the issue in their policy book. So those 15 will have to adopt a policy. And then if this is something that parents want in their schools, it increases their ability to engage with school level staff as well about when corporal punishment is responsible or acceptable for their child. Um, so this is not a, a run around the, right, the statute, it's still allowable. Um, it's really increasing um, parental involvement, agency, and transparency in the issue. So, so that's something, I'm on the education committee and I did not know that. So we have, I think currently, around 174 districts, I think, kind of in there. Mm -hmm. So what you're telling me is there are only only 15 currently allow corporal punishment as a policy, is that As of accurate? right now, um, there are four school districts that permit corporal punish punishment explicitly in policy. There are 11 that are silent on corporal punishment, okay. which means they could choose to use that at the building level. So and one final question. Yes, I, thank you for please. Uh, indulging me. So. Um, if, if a school cannot use corporal punishment, what is the, what is, what do they go to the most to, to punish a student if that's needed? Um, that is a, uh a broad question. Uh, what we've provided at the Kentucky Department of Education in response to the School Safety and Resiliency Act is what we call the Trauma-Informed Toolkit. Um, this is a toolkit that lives on our website that provides a large number of various disciplinary resolutions from classroom to system level resolutions. Um, and, and so districts have access to that. We have training to support that, webinars to support that. So if districts want to pivot away from corporal punishment, we are prepared to pr provide research-based um, trauma-informed practices to support them in that effort. Thank you. Senator Yates. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you. That's, I was scratching my head because I remember the debate in, um, here last year. The Kentucky Board of Education, the Lubbock members, unanimously passed to end corporate punishment in Kentucky that um, we're one of 19 states that still have it and that have not prohibited it in the statute book. Um, there's only four school districts that actually have it um, put into place that's permitted and you said there's 11 other that don't do it but have not specifically restricted it by statute so it looks like they're running them pretty close to some legal challenges there in the event that they did um, it passed the house I believe but we let it die in the Senate we never voted on it is my understanding um, but this bill as changes would this restrict the actual physical pain um, is it if this is passed so um, this change here today? Yeah, so that's a good question. The way we are approaching that in the regulation is that districts will have to adopt a policy. And within their policy, they will have to provide their own limits on corporal punishment. And they will have to also um, define the instrument to be used to administer corporal punishment. We chose to go that way because it allows the parents in that school board meeting to come and voice their opinion and be engaged in that process. We know that corporal punishment is an issue that varies from community to community and home to home in Kentucky. So we wanted to really leave that um, up to that local community. If they choose to use corporal punishment, then they can choose what those local limits are. But they have to codify that in policy so it's transparent and everybody knows what's expected. Yes, please go ahead. And because of these local school districts would not have the guise of immunity that we do, 
they potentially hold themselves open to liability. Is that correct? We do think that this provides some liability protection to districts, being able to be a little more transparent in what their policies are. Um, and, and that parental um, consent up front, we think, provides some liability protections for districts as well. well and I would argue the opposite. I, I think it's a good thing to put in place. It lays out what the parameters are. But in the event they breach that, I think it leaves major ex um, makes them majorly exposed to some large verdicts yes. uh, in the event they choose to do so. And we will also monitor, that's why the data collection has been expanded for corporal punishment. Data collection is not new for corporal punishment, but we've expanded, we've added about five things tied to this so that we can uh, monitor corporal punishment as well from the state level. Thank you. Representative Marzian, did you have a question? Just real quickly. Um, yes, ma'am, go ahead. I think this is a great idea. So if you're in a district that may still allow it, the few, would they call a parent first to inform them uh, it, and let them know that that was gonna happen? And the parent can say, no, I don't want you to hit my kid. Yes. So that would happen before, okay. That's correct. Parents within the first five days of enrollment will have to give written consent. So right now, a lot of districts use an opt-out policy, but this will make the, that be an opt-in policy for corporal punishment. And then they'll have to call the day of, and get verbal consent from the parent before. Um, admission corporal punishment and then it's very clear in the regulation a parent can withdraw consent at any time during the school year very good thank you are there any other questions I, I would just like one clarification I think in your statement you mentioned that for those that still do allow that which is four but there are 11 others mm -hmm. that haven't addressed it and 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 I'm I apologize, but you you made a statement something about the, the the individual that could administer that was the principal or or assistant principal or assistant principal. But then you followed that up by saying, and I don't remember what you said exactly after that, that somebody else could not be involved with that. Please sure. clarify that for me again. Yeah. So thank you for that. So um, in a so only the principal or assistant principal can administer a corporal punishment, and they must do so in the presence of another certified staff member. So I'm, I may have neglected to mention the witness. Um, what we've included here is a requirement that no other staff member can be required to witness or administer. So if the principal doesn't want to administer corporal punishment, the superintendent could not compel them to do that. Um, and maybe the assistant principal would be the administer of corporal punishment. Same thing for the witness. If a teacher does not want to witness a corporal punishment, they cannot be compelled to witness a corporal punishment. Okay, thank you. I, I was wanted to make sure I heard that correct as you gave that. Anything else? Well, thank you both today very much uh, for your responses and your time uh, and excellent presentation. Very well done. Uh, there being no further questions, would you please call the next regulation? Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Labor Cabinet Department of Workplace Standards, 803-KAR-1006-026-61-64, Seventy six, eighty one, and ninety one. These all have staff suggested amendments. Eight oh three one oh oh six through one oh nine one update workplace standards, including identifying an employer employee relationship, equal pay provisions, overtime pay requirements, provisions for trading time, identifying what constitutes working time record keeping requirements, criteria to identify professional employees, exclusions from minimum wage and overtime requirements, allowances credited as wages, and special rates for workers with disabilities. The staff suggested amendments amend various sections to comply with CARES Chapter 13A, including adding incorporated material. Good afternoon. Would you please uh, both at this time identify yourself for the record, please? Uh, John Galian, uh, General Counsel for the Department of Workers' Claims, or, or Workplace Standards, uh, relatively new position. So my name is, I'm the Assistant Director for Division of Wages and Hours. Sir, could you please push your button and it's a green light on it, please say, say Yes, that sir. Again. There it goes. Uh, Dwayne Hammonds, I am Assistant Director for the Division of Wages and Hours, Kentucky Labor Cabinet. Thank you very much, uh, both of you today, for being with us. There are staff amendments uh, to this set of regulations. Is there a motion for approval? There is a motion and approval of the staff amendments. Without objection, it is so ordered. 
Are there any questions from the members of the subcommittee today? Okay. I think Senator West is going to begin the questioning today, so go ahead, Senator West. Thank you. Um, most of my questions are going to uh, revolve around the employer-employee relationship test, so to speak. So if you could please describe for us <laughs> kind of the – I know we recently did a reauthorization of this, maybe in October, November, sometime in that range, uh, pertaining to the sunset provisions. So we reauthorized that language. Now we're coming back and we're changing that here, I believe. You can correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, but if you could describe the existing test, how it works and the, the elements, and then how, once we make, were to make these changes, how would that new test look, if you could? Okay, I can take that. The, uh, the existing test it is a, basically a holistic test of six questions, or the, the previous test was six questions that tested the relationship between the employer and the employer uh, as far as uh, subjects like control, uh, profit loss margin, um, any of those aspects. We do not look at one question uh, individually. We look holistically at all questions. The updated questions will basically confer with the federal regs, which we had six questions. The feds, uh, the Federal Department of Labor had seven questions. We've added that one question. Everything else has is existing before uh, the the updates. So, if you could describe that seventh, what what the feds added there? Uh, the uh, seventh question that we added to coincide with them was the permanency of the relationship, which would be used to determine the length of that uh, relationship between the employer and their employer. It is a part of, but not the end result of that test. Um, so this is completely to comply with, match the federal standard? Yes, that, sir. I'm assuming. Yes, sir. Um, do we have to match the federal standard? No, not necessarily, sir. We, I mean, we were we were good with it before, uh, but we felt like we needed clarity on that. This is an issue that is coming up in our office quite often now. Misclassification of employees has become a a problem, and we felt like not only did our department but the entire state needed clarification uh, to help with this. Uh, most of the updates for the reg made it user friendly, being able to con you know go through those questions and also expand, especially on the control, being able to expand on that aspect of the regulation. So will, will this make it easier to find that someone is a, a, a worker rather than an independent contractor? It gives us some other options that we can apply to that synopsis, yes, sir. Okay. So what are the effects of, from a liability standpoint, of finding someone is a worker rather than an independent contractor. Anyone who is classified as an independent contractor is not subject to Chapter uh, 337, which are all of the uh, labor laws that indicate payment of wages, hours worked, rest breaks, lunch breaks, uh, those aspects. Uh, to determine the relationship is the number one thing that we do on every case. We determine if they are an employee with that relationship. If they are, they are subject to uh, all of the statutory regulations of 337, which would be minimum wage, overtime, uh, like I said, rest breaks, lunch breaks, uh, all of those uh, statutory regulations. So if, uh, if I could. Yes, please continue. So, so um, if, if we have a, let's say a construction site and you've got a general contractor and there are independents obviously working on that job site, isn't that important to keep that separate and does this blur the lines there does that does this cause any negative consequences as far as causing the gc to now be the the employer for the purposes and put new liability on them no sir it, my belief is that we're not changing the regulation we are just helping solidify it for uh user purposes it is not going to change the relationship between that general contractor and those contractors um that relationship will still be there. It just gives us clarity and helping to determine if they have that, uh, if they are statutorily 
regulated by 337 or not. Thank you. Uh, Representative Bridges has a question at this time. I guess my question that I see on here where the intent was necessary to clarify what constitutes an employee and an employer relationship. But my concern, because I, I'm in the real estate business, it involves uh, independent contractors. I'm in the uh, construction business and it involves independent contractors. That, uh, uh, I just feel like there's some things in here that's pushing it more to make them hourly employees rather th and take away their independent contractor status. And I, I've just got some concerns. I know back uh, uh, just a few years ago, we even had a uh, special task force addressing a lot of what's in this regulation here. And I, I'm just concerned there may be some lines that's being blurred that uh, actually probably would be better administered through statutes rather than through regulations. Uh, well, I mean, part of the uh, test is to determine that relationship you know, protect the employee, that we're trying to protect that person against uh, non-payment of wages or non-payment of overtime. Uh, we don't feel like we have changed the regulation on what it was in the past. Uh, the lines do blur. That's why we need the clarification of it so that we can come to that determination. May I follow up? Go ahead, Rich. Well, you, you mentioned that employee, but if they're an independent contractor, they're not an employee. And True. they have independently chosen not to be an employee so it seems to me like you're infringing on their right, their option to choose, and you're going to force them into an employee-employer contractor relationship that their uh, their their intent is not to be that. They they want to be independent. They want to act on their own, and they want to have their own. Uh, uh, they want to establish their own rules, which they've agreed to work by. So I've got some concern that we're pushing them in that direction that that they've not chosen to. Um. I think it's important to note that <clears throat> no one factor is more important than the other in these uh, when we're evaluating this situation. It's just uh, additional. It's meant to provide additional clarification, and you know, also when we're you know in the weeds, so to speak, and considering whether an individual might be an independent contractor or not. Clearly, what that independent contractor had to say would factor into this determination. So we're not trying to pigeonhole anybody who doesn't want to be there. Is that fair to say, Dwayne? Yes, yes, sir. Uh, I, uh, is that, is that else, Representative Bridge? Just a comment. Yes, go ahead. I, I just feel like uh, this is uh, very uh, subjective and vague, and uh, it, leave, it puts a lot more power into the Labor Department Cabinet's decision rather and taken away from the uh, independent contractor and I, I just, I, I really got some concerns about this. And, and I, again, I feel like it, we may be blurring a line here between statutory and regulatory authority. And it has in the past come to statute and to the legislators, and they have chosen not to act on this. So I, I've got some grave concerns here. I, 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 I'd, I'd really urge us to back up and maybe think about this a little more. Uh, Senator Yates, I think, has a question at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, sitting to my left is my independent contractor, mm -hmm. Jacob Bott. He's not an employee. I don't want to blur that. Uh, but uh, this is one of my, my very close friends' um, son, and he's a very smart young man. And me and him were discussing this. And one of the questions is obviously, in this particular um, scope, we look at totality of the circumstances. You look at each and everything. Um, it's beneficial me as an, an employer and with contractors and employees um, to have very clearly listed um, things that I know that will be considered. What we did is just put into place what has already been done by the Fed government, um, but more importantly, which has been interpreted by the courts, there's already been a precedent set that they interpret one after each time. So as an employer, um, whether I'm an independent contractor or not, I want to know what those parameters that I should be working within um, so that I'm complying clearly with the law. Um, so I appreciate you guys doing that. That was just my only comment. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Are, at this time, are there any other questions for, uh, yes, uh, uh, Senator uh, Adams, go ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, just out of curiosity, I can't see you. I know I'm going to move over here. Um, was this a big problem? Uh, to determine the relationship? 
Uh-huh. Uh it has become more prevalent um that a lot of employers uh are kind of blurring the line on whether or not it is an independent contractor versus uh an employee employee relationship. Part of the biggest thing is the control. Uh, the employer has the control. The employee does not have the ability for profit loss margin, which uh, is clearly stated in our in, in the test. And we look at, like I said, we look at it holistically to try and determine that relationship. And and how long has this been a big problem? I, I can only speak for the time period that I've been uh, an investigator and also uh, assistant director, which is over the past uh, little over four years. Okay, so it's been a problem for four years. Um, now I'm curious about the input that you received um, in working on this regulatory change. Um, who weighed in on this? Uh, let's see. We received comment from uh, Association of, excuse me, I have it here. We received two comments on this regulation and so it's a big problem and we're making a regulatory change and we heard from two people that's correct <laughs> okay um what am i missing here <laughs> well because it doesn't see it, it, to me like I'm, I'm just very curious about the genesis of this whole thing um and the genesis of this doesn't seem to me to rise to a level of this dramatic of a regulatory change well so i'm i'm kind of along the same lines as representative bridges can we push the pause button for a second so we can just kind of reevaluate? because this is a this is a big change and um we've had two comments two people comment on it so i was just throwing it out there mr chairman yes ma'am would you like to go ahead, sir, respond to that yeah. if you'd like to? I, I would just say that part of the genesis of these regulatory changes were part of the certification process. And as we did these updates, we received comments from individuals who had concerns about the, this uh, regulatory process, but or regulation, excuse me, but also part of it was just our experience that Mr. Hammond spoke to about needing clarity as we enforce the, the statute and regulation. We quickly we uh, we do have some people that are signed up to speak against this regulation. But before we go that route, we do have a couple more questions. Uh, Senator West, go ahead, sir. Thank you. Um, so, so for clarity, um, what I think I hear you saying is with this new regulation, it's going to provide clarity and it it will be more objective and less subjective. So is your position that this new test allows for more objectivity and less subjectivity? That's our intent, sir. That, uh, so yes. Did you think that's what it does? or That's your intent as yes. the cabin? Okay. Thank you. Senator Yates, would you have a follow-up question, please? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just, I want to make sure that we're all reading the same changes because it looks to me, obviously, the totality of the circumstances is already considered. Yes. So these things we're talking about today in the past have been considered clearly. It's, and so I've been litigating these for a long time. I have an injured person that's hurt by somebody who is working for a company. They say they're an independent contractor. I go through and do the test. Are they really an employee of the independent contractor since time I started litigating, whether I'm doing defense or plaintiff's work? Um, what you're doing is laying out the individual prongs that are already there for a point of clarification, because these are things that are considered, but we want to make sure they've broken out more detailed so that we see that. So whether this is passed or not, these things are considered. What you're doing is laying out these prongs so it's it's more clear. Is that correct? Yes, sir. They, you know, we do not have to check all the questions. Sure. Uh, we have to. We look at the, like you said, the totality of it. There is this reg is not a change. This reg is just a change in order to become compliant with the with, with the feds and with LRC uh, to determine, you know, that. And, and make it more, you know, clear and clear for uh, the public. Similar to what the courts have done through precedent. Yes. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, thank you all very much. Uh, we do have some people that signed up to speak against this. So if it's, I'm going to ask both of you to please just uh, 
move back to the chairs and uh, stay close and I will have you come back and respond in just a few moments. Yes, sir. Uh, who is, uh, whoever is, uh, I think I have a couple people listed here, but whoever's going to come and speak against this, please come to the table at this time. I guess we just have one. That's all you get, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, please, uh, sir, introduce yourself for the record at this time, and then you may proceed. Thank you very much. My name is Tom Underwood. I am the State Director for the National Federation of Independent Business. Our organization is the largest uh, national organization that represents specifically the small business community. Our average uh, member's employment is somewhere between 3 and 20, and then we have thousands and thousands of sole proprietors that are also our members. I, in addition to that, I serve as the chairman of the Kentucky Small Business Caucus, which is made up of 30 business organizations, and uh, some of our members were part of the uh, comments that were filed, and I believe I've also delivered a letter from the Associated General Contractors to staff this morning. I've been the chair of NFIB for 31 years now here in Frankfurt, and these regulation changes that are proposed are the first ones I've seen that actually cut clarification out of the current regulations. I have a document here that was prepared by legal counsel. On this document, the things that came out are in red. The things that went in are in green. And you'll see that page after page, lots of examples and guidance was cut out of the actual red regulations page after page we do i do have i don't have that information i do have the letter do all the members have the letter that was distributed senator gates do you have this letter right here oh i do okay yes and senator gates let me apologize that you don't have this document i only received it this morning and got a chance to be briefed by legal counsel this morning i will be glad to provide it to staff so it can be distributed I don't think any of us have that document. No, you do not, sir. But go ahead, sir. You may proceed. Yes, thank you very much. Independent contractor status is a pathway to entrepreneurship in Kentucky. Many of our small business communities started out as, if you will, a side hustle or a, uh, a hobby or a opportunity to start doing their own work for themselves. In fact, in Kentucky, we have 351,000 plus small businesses, and that represents 43.8% of all private employees in the state of Kentucky. But add to that, we have 285,000 sole proprietors right now. Our concern is, is that by removing clarity in these regulations, that it will have a chilling effect on organizations, larger organizations that would consider hiring small businesses and entrepreneurs because of the concerns about falling afoul of these regulations. Uh, we continued to dig into this and get more information and would prefer to continue working on this uh, should they be deferred today. But uh, that's the basis of my uh, comments here today. A lot's already been said. Thank you, Mr. Underwood. Uh, are there any members has any questions for Mr. Underwood? Uh, Representative, uh, or I'm sorry, <laughs> Senator West, pardon me. Go Cl ahead, sir. Close enough, Mr. Chairman. Um, in your opinion, and I realize this is your opinion, it's anecdotal probably, um, of, of your membership, of the membership you're talking about, mm -hmm. if this were to flow through, if this regulation was to flow through, what percentage of that group would then be considered an employee and no longer an independent contractor? It would be our position that most of these individuals are already independent contractors by definition, uh, particularly a sole proprietor uh, that's out there doing things. We brought up construction a while ago. If someone is, say, a drywall person, they come in under general contractor. The general contractor does have the right to ensure the quality of the work that is done and where it, the drywall goes up on the building. So there is some control factor there, but not enough to say you are an employee now. The other thing that we would be concerned about is, is that my small businesses do not have compliance officers on staff. 
they typically don't have an HR department. And every month, a new set of regulations comes out of Frankfurt, which they're expected to know and, and uh, be able to uh, comply with. And ignorance of the law is no excuse, of course. But that makes it very difficult for someone that has three, five employees and their name over the door to keep up with something like this every month. So we would ask that this continue to be studied. There have been multiple bills filed on this over the years that have not advanced. Uh, and we believe that we're, we're opening up a can here that may cause harm to the small businesses of Kentucky. Thank you. Senator Yates, uh, you may go right ahead, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for being here, Tom. Um, so I keep putting my attorney hat on because that's one I've experienced to know, and, and um, I've had independent contractors, have employees, and, and have to give advice in this area, and, mm -hmm. and the plaintiff worked in this area as well. Um, by listing as one of the things that they consider the permanency of the relationship, mm -hmm. Legally, that's not, it's not making, that's already a factor considered under the totality of the circumstances. Mm -hmm. It's something that whenever I'm making arguments, we talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that you know that as well. Mm -hmm. So by us listing this out, the, the question was, does that change the, any of the employer's or independent contractor's status? Well, if it's already that part of the totality of the circumstances, it is what it is. If we clarify it by listing it out there, do, do you believe that somehow that's gonna change the legality of, of their um, how they're mentioned um, I, it will clarify it for if I'm a small business owner and I don't understand all the laws the, the instruments of it this mm -hmm. isn't what I'm not an attorney I'm just somebody that has independent contractors and it's laid out there for me I think most of them will be appreciative of that if it's not laid out but it is something that will be considered once they're sued that's a little more dangerous is is it do you disagree with that well Senator Yates first off let me say the attorney hat suits you very well and you you wear it well but let me ask a question in, in response to that. Can you give me the definition of permanency of the relationship? Okay. You may respond, Senator. Who's the attorney now? He just swung the questions. Oh, out no, sir, not me. <laughs> but, but I will. So my understanding of will be under the totality of the circumstances. And so that all it's saying is that's something that will be considered in light. And ever in these cases, they're so fact driven. Mm -hmm. um, so it, I know that you'll look at who else do you do work for? How's that done over the period of time? Um, whether or not that is that you're going to have future contracts or not, I'm sure. But whenever they're if you're just doing a general like all of the different bullet points are going to be very general open ended would mm -hmm. you I mean and that's just purposely done um, but I th would think that this would be laid out because that's something that's going to be considered and like a lot of my businesses if if you're over in Indiana or whatnot um, you know you're going to have to comply with the federal governments as, as well mm -hmm. um, so again I'm still learning here and I'm open for discussion on it but you hit me with a question do you but, but I'd still like to know what, what your opinion of your members are does that really change um, the fact that we have literally codified one of the things that are already considered? Does that really change their status as an independent contractor in any way? Well, the question is, and I continue because we're having a discussion on this is if I am the proverbial drywall hanger, and as you are well aware, there is a major labor shortage across the state and I am uh, a general contractor putting up houses in a development yeah. and I've got my drywall hanger that goes from house to house to house to house to house. Is that permanency? Or uh, is may I enter? May I enter? Please object here. Uh, generally, the protocol is not for the questions to be asked back to the members, but my, I allowed you to ask that one question. Yes, sir. Uh, I would just ask, please re make the comments on my that. deepest apology, Mr. That's, Chairman. That's certainly that's certainly okay. Would you like to comment anymore? No, I, th I think that covers, thank you. Okay. Um, are there any other questions? Um, Mr. Underwood, uh, and I haven't spoken to you this, so we just had the emails and the letters here and just cordially spoke to you as, as we began prior to the meeting. So I wanna make sure I understand what you're basically here asking us to do, or you're, you're asking this committee to defer this or ask the cabinet to defer for us to ask the cabinet to defer this for more uh, discussion is that your 
yes, attention sir. today. Yes, sir. That would be my request. And as uh, was noted by Senator Rocky Adams, this is not a house burning down right now, but we would like to make sure that we don't light a match. Okay. If there are no questions for uh, Mr. Underwood, I'm going to have the other gentleman come back to the table, respond, and uh, if there are any other questions, we will take those, but we're going to be rather brief. But I'll go ahead, gentlemen, both of you, and you've already introduced yourself, so you don't have to do that again, but if you'd like to respond to anything Mr. Underwood said, uh, you may go ahead at this time. I think the only thing I would note is, as Senator Yates noted, um, we are simply adding factors that courts already determine. And as we've tried to lay out, we are here to just essentially provide some additional clarity. And this is not meant to be, and it is not a drastic change to the regulatory scheme. And we would just ask that the committee consider that. Senator West, did you have a follow-up question? Yeah, a um, couple here real quick. Um, we talked a lot about totality of the circumstances. And I'm looking at the proposed reg here in front of me, and I, I, I cannot find totality of the circumstances. I believe, was it in the prior reg, and we've taken that it's out? Case law. It's in the case law. Case law, okay, case, okay. I did not, just want to make sure where that was coming from. So you're talking about the court, when it's considered, the court will consider the totality of the circumstances is what we're talking about, okay. Um, so if the courts are already doing this, then what's, why the need for this regulation? Uh, once again, why, why are we even here? Again, two objectives. One, to meet the certification requirements of House Bill 50. Also, uh, you know, when we know this is going to be a factor that's going to be considered when staff is having this question, we just think it's a, um, a good thing to just put it put all the cards on the table so to speak okay i have no further questions mr mr chairman senator yates uh, has a question go ahead senator thank you mr chair um we were asked and, and again to me I, I love open discussion i love debate i like that's how we learn things and i'm also worried about uh, I don't like to cram something down someone's throat real fast uh, in the event they have some worries. To me, I think this is pretty clear cut and not a big deal, but um, do you see th there was a request that we defer, have additional discussion together, um, and then you know, hopefully lay things out. Um, do, you, do you see any issues or problems um, in the event that this is deferred? Um, we would prefer not to defer it. Um, we think that we're merely adding the requirements that courts have laid out and uh, we would ask that it not be deferred. Okay, and I, and I get that, obviously, I yeah. move forward, but I know, I'm, I'm in this, counting the votes right now, and I think that's probably likely what's gonna be happen. Um, can you tell me if there's any issues or problems that will happen with the deferment? Because um, that, that may be may a change. If there's gonna be some kind of reason that you shouldn't do it, um, mm -hmm. other than inconvenience, just let me know. Um, just the we have a reg that's set to expire in september i believe in september and you know there's a tight time frame to get this one up and going by august if all goes well and you said it's by august yeah, well if we were if it was to get out of the arts committee then go through the subject matter committee it would i believe come effective in August before the current existing regulation is set to expire. So your testimony is that in the event we defer today that we not we not be compliant? Well, the, the, there could be a potential for that. Okay, thank you. Senator Alvarado. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Listen to a lot of the conversation here. Here's a fundamental question is, I don't know that you have the authority to put this, what you're trying to get done in regulation, to be perfectly honest. Um, this is why this has been proposed through legislation before. And we've had this topic has been covered through years past. So when the legislature is proposing legislation, I think that implies that this has to be done through the legislature as far as changes. I don't know that you have the authority. If you're not willing to defer, Mr. Chairman, I would make a motion to find it deficient. Before, Senator Alvaro, before we go down that road, um, Senator West had a follow-up question. And I think Senator Adams had a question as well. Um, something I really don't understand here is, is if if this is in existing case law, uh, this is precedent. The court uses the totality of the circumstances standard, 
and this is not a significant regulatory change. But we have members on this committee who are legislators, and many of who have significant, it appears to me, significant questions on this regulation. Why are we not willing to do a deferral and take another, another month to look into this and just get some further clarification on this I issue? Again, just because we feel that this is something we do have the authority to do pursuant to 295 and because we're simply adding a factor um, that's in existing case law, we feel that there's um, th this reg is um, ready to go, so to speak. Senator Adams, do you have a question, please? Yes, thank you. Just to follow up, um, as a result of the, um, and I'm sorry, I forgot your name, um, testifying that you would not um, defer, um, let me ask you this. The testimony that you heard here today and the information that we got from AGC and some of their concerns, when they submitted their comments during the um, comment period, did you take any of their um any of their concerns into account when pulling together this new reg? We certainly considered their comments, but considering that the factor was in case law and already used, we did not take action on their comments. Oh, okay, so you, um, you, you read them, but you didn't take them into consideration, and they're here today saying that let's take another look at this. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of of the opinion of Chairman West. I, I hope that you will consider deferring again. I understand, but I think we just, we've reached a point where we need to move forward. Thank you, Mr. Anything Chairman. Else, uh, uh, Representative uh, Bridges has a question briefly, Representative Bridges. I just, uh, more of a comment, uh, Chairman. You know, I look back, and I, I know the IRS already has, a, uh, you know, an 11-factor criteria that we have to follow that's already set precedence in this. We go back to laws as far back as, I think it's 1947, where, uh, you know, the Supreme Court ruled. We've got these, and uh, uh, we've heard the words like codify. There's already law. And, and I, I have to go back to what Senator Alvarado said. I believe you're stepping beyond your authority and you're, you're attempting to make law rather than make regulations. And I, I've really got a problem with this and I would really urge you to consider deferring this. Let's take this back a step. Let's talk and get other organizations. You know, we, we've got the home builders, we've got the AGC, we've got the uh, Kentucky Realtors, we've got so many associations out there that I think could be a part of this conversation that could give us a lot better in-depth look to uh, help maybe clarify some of these things before we put them, as, as you say, codify them to where there's no backing up on them. And I, I just want to really urge you to reconsider what, what, what you're apparently insisting on because it, it, it feels, I just feel like there's, there's a handful of people in the labor department that wants to make all these decisions and it's not their job to make them it's their job to enforce the decisions we make and, and I, I just i can't urge it strong enough that uh, I, I believe you'd be doing the uh, the independent contractors the employers uh, i mean trust me i i i want to be a a, a consumer advocate i, I want to protect the employees and the employers but I don't think this is the proper steps to take at this time, and I, I would urge you to reconsider that and get more people to the table so we've got a wider field of knowledge that, of participation in this. Because like you said in your words, you've, you've had a couple. And uh, this, this goes back more than just four years. This goes all the way back to employer, employees, uh, everything else. So I, I think there, there's a lot of wisdom that, that's going to be lost if we move forward today, and I, I would just urge you to to reconsider that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As the presiding chairman today, uh, I have attempted to give everyone the opportunity to speak uh, and, and, and give their, their opinions and voice uh, speaking on the matter of pro or for and against, and I think we've had some very healthy questions. 
and very good questions. Uh, and I would, I'm going to ask the question myself. I know everybody, several have, have brought it up, but I'm just going to ask the question now in the official role as being the chair of this committee meeting today. Would you consider a deferring of this uh, regulation from this meeting today? Uh, no, uh, we'd have to respectfully decline. Okay, sir, I, I appreciate that very much. Uh, Senator West, did you want to respond? Did you have anything else? Okay. Uh, all right, uh, Senator Alvarado, I'm going to I'm going to come back to you. Please. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, you used to say that we need to do this. It's not that you need to. It's that you want to do this. Not that you need to. That's not absolutely. That's not true. So that word is incorrect that you're saying here today, and it looks just like another attempt of the administration really trying to push policies that you can't get done through legislation because this has been filed before, and the way we get these things done are through legislation, not because you want to do them. When you want to do them, it's up to this body to make that determination. I make a motion for deficiency, Mr. Chairman. There has been a motion made. I'm sorry, excuse me. There has been a motion made to find KAR 001-006, just that specific regulation there, 803 KAR 001-006, deficient. Is there a second? Second. There is a, m a motion and there is a second on the deficient motion. Uh, is there any discussion on that? All right. The question then is on the motion to find just this specific regulation that I that I named the num specific number of to find this rec that specific regulation deficient. All of those in favor of finding the regulation deficient will vote aye, and all of those opposed will vote no. It will take five votes in favor of the deficient motion for this to pass. Would you please call the roll on this deficient motion, please? Senator Rocky Adams. Aye. Senator Alvarado. Aye. Senator Yates. Mr. Chair, may I briefly explain my no vote? Yes, sir. Go right ahead, please. Um, Colleagues, I, I will vote no because I, I do believe that the, they do have the authority to be able to define the, um, the parameters in which they're enforcing. I don't believe it's deficient. Um, I'm a little disappointed that there wouldn't be an agreement to defer, and I understand why we're here, and I saw that coming. I um, tried to throw that softball out in place. Um, this is a particular example where we could have brought in all the players to the table. I think that there may be some miscommunication um, onto it and maybe even some misunderstanding, and that's when we slow things down and we sit down and discuss it and work it out. Um, but I do not believe it's deficient, so I'm voting no. Representative Bridges. Mr. Chairman, explain my vote. Yes, sir. I'd just like you two gentlemen to take it back to the Labor Department. I'm very disappointed. We, uh, you know, you, you, you talk as there's an urgency, but you yourself said September. Uh, but my calculations, that's four months. It's plenty of time to get others to the table to consider what's going on. And, uh, uh, I, I think there's a grave injustice being done. I think the department is overstepping their boundaries, uh, trying to make law rather than enforce law. And uh, I'm just highly disappointed in this, and I'm sure we will most likely be readdressing this in the near future. And uh, if it goes back to the legislators, I, I would say it'll be addressed pretty harshly. And I just want to express my disappointment, and I do vote in favor of the deficiency. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Representative Frazier Gordon. Aye. Representative Marzian. Representative Senator West. Explain my vote. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I vote aye. Um, and much of my thinking kind of uh, goes along with Senator Yates. Um, we had an opportunity here to get some more discussion. Um, talk about the issue a little bit more clearly legislators here had questions so the goal of this reg is to bring clarity to the statute so so what is going to happen now is for the past two sessions we have passed Senate Bill 65 which makes all deficient regulations null and void so now by by what we're doing today we are currently finding this deficient now this regulation is on the fast track to be found null and void in January, February, or March of next year. And so all we've done is rather than 
provide clarity, we will now have a la total lack of clarity because it, this most likely will be find, found null and void once we come back into session. But I vote aye. And Representative Hale. I would uh, like to explain my vote as well. Um, contrary to what a lot of people think, this committee does not like to find regulations deficient. We do, we do not like to go down that path. You can look back through the records, we find very few regulations on this committee deficient. And we, we would certainly ha would have not wanted to go down that path today. And um, there was every opportunity given for a deferral of this to get together with all the parties involved and have some more discussion about this. But uh, that path was not chosen by you gentlemen. And so therefore, this committee had no further choice with the, with the opinions and thoughts of the members than to bring this as a deficient motion. And so therefore, I vote aye on this uh, motion. I have you please announce the total please I have um, six eyes and two nays we needed five votes so therefore the motion carries with six votes voting aye and two votes uh, two votes of nay the motion does carry to find this regulation deficient we now will proceed with the rest of the regulations on this uh, specific set and I think we do have a gentleman that is, well, I'm gonna, let me go this route. On uh, KAR 001091, the Workers with Disabilities, would you gentlemen like to address that in any manner? Do you have anything you'd like to say on that? Because we do have an individual that's signed up to speak against that. This is uh, KRS 337. Um, Uh, o one O um, provides uh, an exemption for the minimum wage requirements uh, if, for those I'm, who are. I'm sorry, sir. I don't mean to interrupt you. Is your mic on? Uh, yes, uh, I, I, I think so. Yeah, just yeah, kind okay. of pull it a little bit closer to you if you can. We want to make sure we yeah. get everything on the recordings. I didn't mean to interrupt you. My apologies. Not at all. Uh, KRS three thirty seven O one O two A five provides uh, an, an exemption for the minimum wage wage requirements for those who work in a sheltered workshop. Uh, 091 is just a regulation that clarifies uh, when this exemption applies. Okay, thank you, sir. Are there any questions on, on this specific regulation we're dealing with? If you gentlemen would not mind if you would just step away from the table again, please. Uh, we have uh, someone that is signed up to speak against that, and if they would come forward at this time. Are there two? Yes, please, both of you come forward. Good afternoon, uh, both of you. Would you please, at this time, uh, introduce yourself for the record today? Uh, Kevin Sharkey, I'm a staff attorney with Kentucky Protection and Advocacy. Go ahead, sir. Oh, my, my name. Oh, my, my name is uh, I'm Frankie Huffman. Oh, I'm on the pad board at PNA. Thank you both today for being with us. Uh, uh, Mr. Sharkey, uh, you may proceed and uh, testify as to why you are against this regulation today. You may go forward. All right. Um, I work with Kentucky Protection Advocacy, which is the state's federally mandated disability rights legal agency. And um, I'm speaking today on behalf of the Protection and Advocacy's, Advocacy's PAD board which is comprised of individuals with disabilities and their families who um, advise PNA on issues and priorities that are important to the, to the um, community of individuals with developmental disabilities. Um, 
in August, the uh, Labor Cabinet proposed um, amendments to Regulation 803-190, and those amendments basically changed the language from sheltered workshop to work activity centers and from, um, I think it was handicapped workers to, and it changed it to workers with disabilities. The PAD board commented on those regulations back in August, but it, it that regulation kept getting deferred. And I think in January, the cabinet issued a new regulation, which is this one, 803-0190, which basically was the amended version of 803-1090. The PAD board submitted comments to those, to the labor cabinet's new shelter workshop regulations. Um, so what what they what would the PAD board and PNA would like is for the labor cabinet to repeal the old regulation and not issue this regulation, and that's that was that is what was in the comments that the PAD board submitted in March. The PAD board recommended that they repeal the regu regulation. Um, so that it would effectively stop the issuance of new certificates under uh, Section 14C of the, the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938. Um, as justification for the proposed action, the PAD Board pointed out that since the passage of the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938, Congress has passed uh, decades of progressive uh, civil rights litigation which improved the education, training, and employment uh, opportunities for individuals with disabilities. Specifically, the board pointed out that sheltered workshops and subminimum wages directly contradict the Americans with Disabilities Act and um, the Olmstead integration mandate. The ADA pro prohibits discrimination against individuals with disabilities, and as interpreted by the Supreme Court of the United States, uh, prohibits unjustified segregation of people with dis disabilities in placements which isolate them from participating in the community life and severely limiting them from everyday activities, including education work and social contracts. Um, I guess in recognition of this contradiction between sheltered workshops, subminimum wages, and um, the ADA, there have been bills passed in, in Congress the United States Congress uh, that would phase out subminimum wages for individuals with disabilities, and several states have passed, have either eliminated or have begun phasing out uh, recognition of 14C certificates. Um, in Congress, Senate Bill 3238, introduced in November of last year, would prohibit the issuance of new certificates and allow. Um, and would phase out existing sheltered workshops over the next five years. Grants would be awarded to states and certain eligible entities to assist them in transform, transforming their business model to support people with, in, with individuals with disabilities. The states which have eliminated or begun phasing out um, recognition of 14C certificates includes Minnesota, Alaska, Maine, Maryland, New Hampshire, Oregon, Vermont, Rhode Island and Texas. In North Carolina, the Centers for Public Representation partnered with that state's protection, protection and advocacy agency uh, to pursue an initiative and potential litigation to expand supported employment and eliminate reliance on 14C certificates. A settlement was reached in February of this year uh, that phases out sheltered workshops over the next five years and will lead to minimum wage pay for at least a thousand employees. Um, here in Kentucky, the governor have, has issued an executive order in 2020 stating that competitive integrated employment in the community shall be considered first and foremost a primary option for persons with disabilities of working age who desire to be employed. The legislation recently passed a bill establishing a 28-member council called the Employment First Council that advises the executive and legislature, 
legis legislative branches about matters pertaining to um, increase meaningful competitive integrated employment for persons with disabilities. And in the past four legislative sessions, a bill has been filed which would prohibit the Labor Cabinet Commissioner from issue, issuing new 14C certificates to any employers. In, um, in its statement of consideration to the PAD board, the Labor Cabinet stated that the enabling statute does not allow for the commissioner to not issue a regulation concerning individuals with disabilities. Uh, we, we disagree with that. Uh, KRS 337295 states that regulations issued by the commissioner may include regulations governing workers with disabilities. May is permissive, meaning that the commissioner has the choice to issue regulations governing workers with disabilities or not issue regulations governing the people with disabilities. Thus, if the commissioner repeals 803-190 and does not issue this new regulation, it would be a valid exercise of the commissioner's statutory authority. This is what happened in Alaska. Alaska statute, similar to Kentucky, states that the commissioner may issue regulations or orders that provide for the employment of wages lo lower than minimum wage prescribed by statute. And the, the regulation in Alaska um, provided a minimum wage exemption for persons with disabilities and provided the procedures for employers to obtain authorization to pay minimum wages. With the stated goal of, of ending the use of sheltered workshops and sub-minimum wages in Alaska, Alaska's Department of Workforce Development proposed repealing the regulation. After, re after review by the Assistant Attorney General of that state and the regulations attorney who found no legal problems with the proposed action, the regulation was repealed, effectively ending recognition of new 14C certificates. Mr. Sharkey, could I yes. ask you please to try to wrap this up in a I couple am. minutes? All right. It's a Sorry. little bit a little bit longer. Go Sorry. Ahead. Please proceed um, in just a couple more minutes. So just as in Alaska, Kentucky's Labor Cabinet has the authority to repeal subminimum wage sheltered workshop regulation and eliminate the awarding of new certificates under 14C of the Fair Labor Standards Act. Doing so would reinforce Kentucky's stated, pro stated policy prioritizing competitive integrated employment and would incentivize a sense of urgency toward the development of innovative strategies that lead toward the competitive integrated employment of every Kentucky citizen. I appreciate the opportunity to offer comments and I'll pass it to my colleague over here. Please proceed, sir. Would you like to add anything? Oh, he, oh, he. Um, he spoke on a lot that I, that I was going to do, but I also wanted to talk about my, uh, just a little bit about my experience in a shelter workshop. Uh, when I worked at one, I, w I was supposed to get $10 a week, but my, my hands ain't very strong, and they would dock my pay. For, uh, each time that I would drop something on the floor, so I would end up uh, only going home with uh, one time I got a two dollar check, uh, and instead of the thirty dollars. Mm. Uh, it, it's my. It, it, and it's my understanding as well that uh, the shelter workshops was designed to um, help people that came home from a, a World War II, the veterans, uh, uh, get, to gain their, their strength back and help them get a job in the community. And uh, somehow it, uh, it got uh, down to uh, people like us with developmental disabilities. Anything else you'd like to add, sir? Uh, 
You take you take your time. Uh, and the, and then the only other thing I wanted to add is, uh, I I I know people. Uh, it's designed to help you find a job in the community, but I I know people that's been in there for over twenty years, and and they just been in in the workshop. Thank you, uh, Mr. Huffman. That is correct, your name, right, Mr. Huffman? Yeah. Okay, thank you, sir, for your testimony today. We appreciate that, and uh, thank you for being with us today. I, I want to go back just for a moment. Um, thank you for your time. You are very welcome, sir. Uh, Mr. Sharkey? Um, yes. I, I certainly am not going to ask you to repeat your testimony, right. but I'm— I think I'm kind of maybe speaking for most of the committee members here today. I'm not certain what you're really asking us to do. I, I may be a little bit, I may be a little in the dark, and I just for clarification, what are, what are you really asking this committee to do today Com uh, as, as to this regulation? I just, we wanted to express what how we felt about the regulation and what we're basically asking the cabinet labor cabinet to think about not issuing the regulation okay uh senator Alvarado, thank you mr question. chairman I, I can address i think a little bit of this topic um the bill that you're referring to that's filed every year that's my bill senate bill 131 this past year it's to do away with the concept of shelter workshops really for a lot of our folks with disabilities. And for those who are not familiar with this concept, uh, it's uh, basically it allows individuals who have disabilities to work for sub-minimum wage wages. Uh, a lot of these folks, just like Mr. Huffman said, they'll get a check for $2, pennies. Taxes are taken out, other things are taken out. They're, they're working for less than that 777 or whatever the rate is right now. Um, the bill that I propose, these 14C certificates are allowing people to establish sheltered workshops, and the bill would basically say we're not going to establish any new ones so that no more of these can go in. The ones that are there are grandfathered in. There are people with disabilities who like the model, and they like to stay in it, uh, and so no one is going to be required to go out. But in five years, you would close the front door, no more new sheltered workshops, and that people would have to be mainstreamed into mainstream employment. Um, and it really is more of a dignity issue for people with disabilities to at least be paid minimum wage which is probably less than competitive salaries are right now in the workplaces it is. And so um, I'm pretty passionate about this. I file this bill every year. I try to work with a lot of the uh, folks in sheltered employment. I think all of them want to get to the same goal of mainstreaming people. Uh, but the concern is ultimately, do we have enough jobs and enough uh, workforce to be able to help a lot of these folks get into mainstream employment? That's always the biggest concern. Other states have started doing it. But that's, I think, what they're referring to is their concern about the model and the concern we've got. I'll continue to follow that bill. Right. I'm pretty passionate about it. And uh, the key thing is for us to make sure we educate our members. And I know it's an opportunity for us to educate people here in the city. Um, I know that you say you think the commissioner has the authority. Again, it becomes a question of whether or not and your, right. your, your opinion is that they do. Yeah, I, yeah, I heard everything you said on the last yeah. regulation. But this, the, the, the statute is permissive. It, it says he may issue regulations um, concerning individuals with workers with disabilities um i think in the in the uh statement of consideration the cabinet said that based on the definition of of i think it's um definition of a worker and it has shall not include uh issues or workers who have been issued a certificate saying that they're a worker with a disability so he's saying that based on that not the commissioner saying or the cabinet saying based on that that they don't have the authority but the the regulations permissive and says he may issue those um certificates right mr chairman if i could i mean it, it the the concern there just becomes like i said we are trying to 
or close that door to say you will not. I mean, that's what I've been filing so that in the future that they won't be able to issue those. We can mainstream people in. People that are in a situation that they like can stay there. We're not going to force anyone up. It's offering those services, but trying to stop that from happening in the future. And there have been legislative efforts to get that very thing accomplished. Are you asking this committee to find this, to ask them to defer on this, to work on it further? Or are you asking? Y yes. Okay. And yes. I believe that the, the, the labor cabinet um, has the authority to not issue any or to repeal that regu or repeal the regulation and not issue the new regulation and just stop issuing new 14 C certificates in Kentucky and work on um, just establishing programs and that that help with com competitive integrated employment. Thank you. Well, I, Help so I'm, establish that. I'm, very, I'm sympathetic. I, I file that bill every year. I have for several years now. I'll continue to do so, Mr. Chairman. I think that's ultimately the goal. Um, Representative Bridget, I think, has a question. I, I do. It's more out of curiosity than anything because uh, uh, I empathize with, with what you're facing here. And uh, I say that not sympathy. Uh, I don't think you want sympathy, but, uh, you know, to understanding. And I, and I couldn't, by not being in that situation, could ever say I understand. But... Uh, I, I do uh, have a concern about it, but I've also got the opposite side concern. If we were to take this away, is there, is there any studies in the states where it's been taken away of how many, are there any jobs that have been lost because of that? Because as an employer myself and, and uh, employee literally over the 30 years, you know, thousands of employees, you know, there's certain times we, we figure into our expenses and everything, programs like this, so that, because we want to be benevolent, we, uh, and, and I'm not, when I say benevolent, I'm not talking about giving someone something, but allow them the opportunity to be in the mainstream to earn on their own. And if you, if you take this out, my, my concern is that there may be employers say, you know, we can no longer afford to do that, so no one gets to work in that that with a disability or something or they have to they have to make that hard choice not that they want to uh it, it's just a financial decision uh because some of these are, are very mission oriented and, and they they're they operate on a shoestring budget anyway so i'm just wondering if uh, out of curiosity if you got any numbers has there been a decline in employment of those with uh limitations in the states that this has been done away with and uh, I, I don't mean that derogatory or anything like that I'm, I'm actually curious to know because right. uh, we, we don't want to push people and I appreciate Senator Alvarado uh, the grandfather that allows that to keep going for those that choose because there are so uh, but uh, and I'll talk to Senator about this later on of what you know are there are there future ones that would want to be in part of this understanding the the, the lower pay but it gives them something. So I, I'm just asking that. That's right. I'm every, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but everything I've read has showed that there's not been a decline when the state offers supported employment and programs that can allow a person to um, learn how to work in a competitive integrated environment. Um, most of the people in sheltered workshops are capable of doing so. The people that are doing the piecemeal work are, are capable with support from the studies I've seen, t uh, capable with support to work in a competitive integrated environment and get paid uh, a fair wage, which they should. In Thank, the first you. Place. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair, for indulging me. You're very welcome. I think Senator Yates is next on the list. First of all, thank you for being here. And um, like so many, very, um, empathetic understanding and that balance. Uh, it's personal to me and like a lot of families. Uh, my cousin taught at Pitt Academy and part of what she had done would take people and um, with different degrees of abilities and disabilities and we know how much that can change from person to person. Um, but the opportunity to learn how to work, to learn how to be in part of an environment into a workforce, um, the dignity of work are all very important. Um, sometimes though that that is when you get into the workforce, sometimes for a period or some depending on the very degrees of disabilities that someone have, that may be a higher cost to the employer than it actually ever would be in a return. Um, so we do that, we want to do that because it is a benefit to the individual. Um, and I look at like the Harbor House, who I do some of the printing for and things like that, or I have my printing done through them, um, which is, I think is just wonderful opportunities for people to work. Um, 
then this is needing to work. Um, one thing that I, I had thought, and I, I'd love to work with Senator Alvarado on this as we can move forward, um, but potentially you, we also look at what kind of government funds are, are received, and, and you want to make sure that's not offset, but potentially uh, maybe some type of rebates um, that come back tax rebates that can go to the employers who are willing to do that in the event that they are able to pay the minimum wage. Um, but the last thing I want to do is, um, is to make sure that there, there's a loss. And so I think that's one that I'd love to sit down and talk because I don't know the answer, just like you. I don't know. And um, we could look what other in other places. Right. But if you could make sure that the employers, we could let them know saying, hey, even if you're paying minimum wage, um, while you may we may not show that you can derive a substantial benefit, but I mean, some people you absolutely right. I mean, there's there's a lot of people that have certain disabilities, have a lot of abilities that can can turn a major profit for an employer. There's some right. that may not at certain periods. Um, but if you put that letter together, like the 14C, it would be similar. Maybe there could be some rebates or something that would incentivize that because we do want to be a compassionate society, but we want to make sure that we're um, giving people the dignity to work as well. Uh, so anyway, I appreciate your testimony here. I don't think there's an easy answer on it. I mean, obviously this committee, we're, we're limited to what we could do, um, but uh, we'll look to work with our, our good friend in the back row. Right. Thanks. Senator West. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have a one lengthy question. Okay. Um, and it's, this is truly because I, I honestly, I'm confused. I don't know what what's happening. So I'm going to give you the scenario and hopefully you can guide me if I'm wrong, but we have exist, the existing statute, existing structure. Uh, Mr. Huffman has testified, you know, he was negatively impacted under that structure, and clearly that's unconscionable what happened in that situation. This this side, and you have all the way over here, I think Senator Alvarado's bill would be, let's start over, let's, let's pay everyone in these situations minimum wage. Um, as I read this, this reg before us, and we and we're not we can't decide that today. That's that's a statute, a proposed statute. We so as this committee we cannot decide that. But as I read the regulation that's proposed, it appears to me that the regulation is a move from here in this direction by the cabinet. It says uh, no employer shall employ a worker with a disability or work activity center employee at less than the applicable minimum wage, unless the employment has been authorized by a special certificate issued by the commissioner. And or by the Department of Labor, so to me, it's a this reg is granted it does give a lot of latitude to the commissioner, um, but these are per, some pretty tight parameters on these types of workshops. The way I read this, am I out of line on that? Or yes, the I mean you're not out of line, but the the regulation still permits the commissioner to issue new 14c certificates i think there's um i'm not sure how many are in kentucky but what I, what we're proposing is that they don't they they yeah. repeal that regulation and don't issue any new ones we're not proposing your ultimate they, ask is senator alvarado's bill to right and, no I, further and, I, and we think of, that the commissioner yeah. has the authority to not issue regulations uh that would allow for new 14c certificates thank you I'm uh, going to ask the cabinet to come back to the table quickly to any any um, response that they may have, and then we're going to move forward on this. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Thank you. Gentlemen, proceed uh, briefly if you can. Uh, I would just note we understand the concerns that were raised by this group, but when we looked at KRS 337-010-2A5, it does use the word shall not include. And then when we looked at various provisions of 13A, which says by that essentially say that an administrative agency shall not modify or go around the intent of a statute, we felt that we had to issue this regulation. Any, uh, any other comments or questions for these two gentlemen? Uh, uh, Representative uh, Fraser Gordon. 
Uh, thank you for clarifying. Um, so would, in your opinion, would this regulation as written permit the issuance of new certificates? Yes. Okay. Which is what we don't want. Okay. Thank you. Senator West, you have another comment? Yeah, and this is in response to Representative Fraser's question, and you can respond to my response. Um, I think it's a little more, more nuanced than that. I, I think, yes, they can issue these waivers, but they can already do that. And, and so this regulation would not affect that. Uh, and it's really, it's really, although it doesn't affect that, it, it wasn't meant to change that. Is that fair? Right. This is just, th this whole process began as part of the, you know, the updating and the certification process. It would uh, keep in the existing structure. Uh, so, uh, yes, I agree with your comment. Thank you. Anyone else? No other comments? I'll be happy to speak to that, Mr. Chairman, if you allow me to. So, I mean, I think I've, I've had an opportunity to follow this bill before. I've spoken to a lot of the folks who have 14C certificates. Their concerns with this, um, they're concerned with the bill because a lot of them are concerned of how it's going to change it. Again, I think everybody that works in this space with people with disabilities want to see the same goal. They want people mainstreamed, be able to make at least minimum wage. Um, the, heart, the concern there is do we have enough infrastructure to allow those folks? And, and we've gone through multiple variations of this bill. So we've had, we're gonna, we would allow people to be grandfathered in. People who work in this and want to remain in that structure can stay in it. The front door would be closed five years from now. And then at that point, no new 14 Cs would be issued. And then people would be coming out to go work would have to be mainstreamed into mainstream work is the, is the attempt. So the qu concern is, is there enough support to get that to happen? That's the big worry everybody has. I know the administration, uh, everybody's been working towards trying to get that done. Like I said, I'll keep filing the bill um, and keep changing it until hopefully we get enough support. I haven't really forced this a lot of way through, but I know it's, there's a lot of support from um, the disability groups that are out there. I, I, you know, this regulation doesn't change that. I know the concerns from the people, <coughs> excuse me, who have testified, you don't want to have the commissioner issue any, any more, and that's up for debate. Uh, in terms of that, but I don't think this regulation, it just addresses some of the wage rates and definitions for that. Uh, but I think those efforts are going to continue moving forward. I don't know that that would alter what we would do with this, with this, uh, this regulation. So I'm going to kind of go out of line here just a little bit. As, as the chairman, uh, is the committee okay with letting this go forward today? Or do, is, is there any members would like to ask for a deferral? I will ask that question. I don't, I don't think that the change that, uh, that's being requested from those who testify would be accomplished by a deferral with this. I think we, we can continue as a legislature to keep working. I will commit. I will continue to work with that, and I'll keep filing that bill. So that is something I believe in, and um, we are going to keep working on that. I, I think Senator West actually made an excellent point uh, to Mr. Sharkey uh, earlier that this committee is actually very limited to what we can actually do, but uh, at this point... Uh, there does not seem to be a consensus to ask for a deferral from the cabinet on this, so uh, we're going to let this move forward at this time. So at this time, please call the next regulation. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Sorry, Chairman. Uh, there's we had other regulations that were on, set to be heard today: 026, 061, 064, 67, 68, they, 71. They were all called. Oh, okay. So they're they're all combined into one call. Apologies then uh, for the confusion and just I'd like to thank the LRC staff for their help with these regulations. Thank you, gentlemen, and thank you. I appreciate your time today. We know we've kept you here a long time today. But Not at all. Thank you. Please call the next regulations this time. Cabinet for Health and Family Services, Department for Behavioral Health, Developmental and Intellectual Disabilities. 908 KAR 3010 Emergency. This does not have additional amendments. This regulation amends to incorporate the provisions of Senate Bill 100 for essential personal care visitor programs. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for being with us. We know you've been with us a long time this afternoon, so, but please uh, identify yourself for the record today. I'm Rachel Ratliff. I'm the regulation coordinator for the Department for Behavioral Health, Developmental, and Intellectual Disabilities.
Thank you, Rachel. There are no amendments. Are there any questions from any of the members? We have no questions for you, so thank you for your time today. Being thank no you. further questions, please call the next regulation. Department for Community-Based Services, 922-KAR-1470 and 922-KAR-2280, both with staff-suggested amendments. 922-1470 is being amended to update material and consistency between out-of-state employers and minors and allow other forms of, of, of identifying information to be submitted. 922-280 is being amended to remove the option to provisionally hire someone as a child care staff member prior to receiving their state and national background check results, delete language that refers to the phased implementation of background checks for child care staff, change the list of offenses that would disqualify someone from being employed by a child care provider to include a felony under KRS Chapter 209 and misdemeanor crimes relating to the torture of animals or cruelty to animals and eliminate the DCC 504 form due to changes in the fingerprinting process. The staff suggested amendments to these regulations amends various sections to comply with the drafting requirements of KRS Chapter 13A and make technical changes. Good afternoon, ladies. Please make sure your mics are on and identify yourself for the record, please. Good afternoon. My name is Laura Began, and I'm the Regulation Coordinator for the Department for Community-Based Services. My name is Andrea Day. I'm the Assistant Director for the Division of Child Care. Thank you very much, uh, both of you. There are staff amendments uh, today. Is there a motion for approval of the staff amendments? Is There is a motion and a second without objection. It is so ordered. Are there any questions from any of the members today for the ladies? It appears there's no questions, so thank you very much. Uh, is that the last regulation? That thank being you. The, thank you all very much. That being the last regulation, uh, we will be given the date of our next meeting. We are on the schedule for Tuesday, June 14th at 1 p.m. Tuesday, June 14th at 1 p.m. Everyone make a note of that. I would like to thank everybody for your time today. A rather long meeting, but productive meeting. So thank everybody. Be safe going home. We are now adjourned.